Tonight on Conversations, she's a Grammy Award-winning gospel music legend with a celebrated musical career filled with triumphs and challenges. This fascinating interview with gospel great Sandy Patty starts now. Sandra Faye Patty, better known as Sandy. She's a singer known for her wide soprano vocal range and expressive flexibility, which led music critics to dub her the voice. Sandy Patty was born in Oklahoma City, Oklahoma, into a musical family. Her father, a minister of music, and her mother, the church pianist. Growing up in Phoenix and later San Diego, she and her brothers performed in a group known as the Ron Patty family. Sandy studied voice in college, but graduated with an emphasis in conducting. Sandy had no idea how the love of music instilled by her family would lead her to success beyond her wildest dreams and challenges that would test her faith and her family. Please join me now for a wonderful and insightful conversation with the absolutely amazing Sandy Patty. You came from a musical family, so I guess it was sort of natural that music would be part of your life. Music has been a huge part of my life. My dad was a minister of music, my mother a fabulous pianist. So I grew up in the church, and grew up singing. That was our language. A lot of people, you know, were athlete families. We were a singing family. Music has just been the, the language of our family. Did you sing solos when you were little? My dad said I sang my very first solo when I was about two and a half Whoa. years old. It was Jesus Loves Me in a mm -hmm. little church in Oklahoma City, Oklahoma, which my husband and I are now back in Oklahoma mm. City. But I've, I was really a shy kid. Words were very, very hard for me. And I found music, or music found me. And music helped me say the things that were on my heart that I was too uncomfortable to say with just words. I want to tell you, I read that entire book, you're The Voice. You're so kind to do that. Thank well, you. no, I, I got into I couldn't quit. It's just a, it's a powerful book because you're honest. Mm -hmm. This isn't a, gee, if you love God, everything's mm -hmm. great and you won't have any problems. No. That's not the kind of book it is. No, it isn't. But it's still an incredibly encouraging book. And you talked very honestly and openly about painful things. Yeah. Um, and one that I know is painful, but, but you talked about it. And that is that yeah. when you were just a little bitty kid, yeah. your parents left you. Um, with a lady that everyone thought to trust. Yes. And you were sexually abused by her. Yes. Her, she felt that her pleasure was more important than my innocence. And at six years old, you six don't know old. what to do with uh -huh. that kind of trauma. You don't have the language for it. And I felt if I would tell someone, if I spoke up and used my voice, yeah. I would be the one to ultimately get in trouble. Hmm. So I just kept it silent for 30 plus years. All that time you held that in. Held that in, feeling like it was my fault the whole time. And as I began to get into Bible study fellowship and as I began to surround myself with women of God who were speaking truth into my heart, when you put God's word in your heart, all the other stuff has to find another place to go. Mm. And a friend of mine says, all of our pain starts to burp up. Mm. And so I began with, with great counsel from wise women, Christian counselors begin to walk a journey of healing. Um, there were probably things that affected your adolescence, mm -hmm. your young adult life, all because of that incident yes. that happened when you were six years old. Did you think about that at the time? Or, and I'm talking about through those stages yeah. and seasons of life, or did you repress it so deep within you that it never occurred that some of the challenges you faced might have been related to that violation of you as yeah. a human being? Um, I, I felt like all of my life I had pieces of the puzzle. Yeah. I didn't know that those pieces all went together and told a story. I didn't know how they were related. I just felt like I was damaged goods. Hmm. So I believed all of those things. It didn't occur to me that she could be wrong. Hmm. It more occurred to me, oh, she's just underlining how I already feel. So accepting that God loved me for me, that was a hard one for me. Yeah. I could tell people about it, yeah. but it was hard for me to see that that was true for me as well. I, I think opening up about it as, as candidly as you did 
will help a lot of parents to talk to their children mm -hmm. and say, if something like this ever happens yeah. to you, immediately tell me. Yes, absolutely. And it is not your fault. Yeah. Because that is what the perpetrator will always tell you. If you tell, you're going to be the one to get in trouble. And I think it is important to kind of help establish that with your kids, that it is okay to speak up and use your voice. Now you talked about you came from a musical family and music was a very part of your life, but there was still something unique. I mean, let's be honest, Sandy Patty's voice is not just a good voice, it's one of a kind. It's, it's one in a hundred years kind of voice. Mm -hmm. um, even though you still had teachers that said you need to work and develop it. You know, I, I had interesting dynamics with some of my teachers uh -huh. growing up. My elementary school teacher, she was amazing. She just encouraged me and challenged me and saw that I really thrived with learning music. Yeah. My high school teacher, I became a bit bossy <laughs> and I wanted to sort of take over the class. Um, she didn't have the wherewithal to be able to use her voice to say, this is not appropriate. And I didn't have the wherewithal to say, this is not my place. And so I burned some bridges there with some of my high school music teachers. Uh, but I think it's some of those experiences that always led me to want to teach. And I always wanted to be a, a teacher. And, and you've done that? That's been part I've of your done life? I've some, yes. But then um, there was a guy that heard you sing and uh, he thought you were pretty good. His name was Bill Gaither. Yeah. <laughs> He's pretty good too. He's pretty good too. <laughs> you know, I went to Anderson University yeah. in Anderson, Indiana. Bill and Gloria Gaither live very close there. And so they would hear me sing around campus. My parents knew them. They went to college, you know, together. Mm. But as they began to hear me and I would work at his studio quite a bit, one day he called me and said, um, Sandy, we're looking for a backup singer. Huh. to go out with us on our arena tours. Would you be interested? I said, wow, Bill, let me pray about it. Yes. <laughs> you know, I mean, there, there's some things That's that are just quickest an, prayer easy, you've ever had. <laughs> an easy answer. And I felt like um, I was in master class with mm. them, just watching them interact with audiences. And I would be that annoying backup singer that would say to Bill afterwards, now, why did you do this song tonight mm. and you didn't do it last night? And tell me, you know, what you're thinking. And he said, sometimes there's something that happens in a community and a particular song, you just want to minister to them. And mm. I just loved learning so much from them. I wonder if uh, people even can comprehend how much Bill and Gloria Gaither have done for this yeah. country, not just by their music, which has been epic in itself, yeah but by mentoring and training Absolutely. and giving opportunity and elevating yes. young artists Absolutely. to a level they never would have been had it Absolutely. not been for them. And you know, they've never been threatened by anyone. What a great point. They've never, ever been threatened, not once. And Bill always says, and I say this so often now, when the event wins, everybody wins. Mm. So it doesn't matter who hits a long ball, everybody wins. You did some things along the way, um, even singing jingles. Mm -hmm. So what are some that, that we might know of that, that you did? Well, I did Juicy Fruit Gum back but, in, really? um, yeah, I don't know if I can sing it. You might have to pay royalties or something. Uh, but, yeah. you know so what? don't see. Yeah, the musicians, they know, don't sing it. <laughs> um. You think that's copyrighted? Seriously. Oh, yeah. 100%. 100%. 100%. Yeah. I mean, it would be selling Juicy Fruit for heaven's yeah. sake. So it looks like they would want us to. You know. Okay, it, so you I, did Juicy Fruit. I, All right. Dog food. Dog Cat food? food, toilet paper, steak and shake, you know, meaningful things. Yeah. <laughs> a great way, though, to. So, to you and Barry Manilow way. have that in common you because know. he did all those yes, uh, he did. commercials yes, and stuff did. like that. Sandy, singing for her supper in commercials was just a beginning. Now, when we return, you're going to discover the defining people and moments that took her from the heartland of America to national prominence in the music world. Stay tuned for more Conversations. Sandy Patty's first album was an independent effort that landed at Singspiration Records. But before being known as The Voice, there would be a couple of God moments that would give her the confidence and belief in the gifted voice she'd been given. When was the turning point in Sandy Patty's career that it went from being back there 20 feet from the main microphone to filling the arena? Well, I think one of the first things was the opportunity with Bill and Gloria. 
And at the end of their night, they had heard a song I'd recorded that Dottie Rambo wrote. The band played it right before we came mm. out of break. We Shall Behold Him. Yeah. And Bill and Gloria allowed me to sing that at the end of their evenings. And that just began to make the phone ring and people started calling, a little more interested. And so I began to do concerts on my own. But I think the, the Statue of Liberty weekend was yeah. so unusual. You would never think of the Star Spangled Banner as being sort of this career breaking song. Yeah. Um, but I recorded it because they were, we were raising money for the Ellis Island Foundation. Mm -hmm. Someone said, why didn't you do the Star Spangled Banner, put a whole brand new verse to it. So I recorded it, David Clydesdale who arranged it, I said, please don't write me above a B flat. And when I looked at the chart, it was a D flat. I said, what happened? He said, my pencil slipped. <laughs> so, you know, it's when you're handwriting all the charts. He said, don't worry, you're never gonna have to sing it again outside this recording. So I was home, Liberty Weekend, watching it like everyone else. Uh -huh. Suddenly, Peter Jennings comes on the screen. He says, we're gonna wrap up the whole weekend with this little song from a little housewife in Anderson, Indiana, and played the Star Spangled Banner. And you didn't even know it was gonna be on? no idea. The phone started ringing, it was my mother, then I had to put her on call waiting, you know, cause it was call it's waiting nice back then. not nice to put your mother on call <laughs> waiting, Sandy. And people started calling and saying, hey, you're on TV, and <laughs> I refer to it as the best gig I ever had because I was home, yep. and that happened, and the Johnny Carson people watched it, and he invited me to be on the show that week. And it was just kind of one of those surreal things. So odd, oddly enough, the Star Spangled Banner was one of those things that sort of launched my career ahead a little bit. That, and so the Johnny Carson thing obviously exposed you not just to the Christian yes. market, but to everybody. Yes. That was a huge turning point, I'm it, sure, for it was. everything else that happened. It was just so gracious and so kind. The road life is hard. You talk yeah. about that in the book. It was one of the things, again, that was so very honest on your part, yeah. that you're, you're traveling every night to a different place. Oh. Uh, you were taking your kids with you so that you could at least spend time with them. Yeah. But that's hard, living out of a bus in a hotel yeah. and homeschooling and doing all these things. Was there ever a point you just said, I just can't keep doing this? Yeah, you know, the best part of the work, and you all know this, is what everyone sees. Hmm. It's you travel, yeah. you know, the funnest part of your job is right now. Absolutely, yeah. It's the 23 other hours of the day <laughs> that are really yeah. hard work. Yeah. And um, I had a great village with me. I did feel very much that God had called me to this. And when he calls you to something, I believe 100% he equips you. But there is this thing that happens when you're on the road, even though what you do is very real, it begins to not feel like the real world. Mm. and that things don't count. Calories don't count, relationships don't count, mm. all of that. And you have to understand what you do is very, very real. Mm. And keep your feet grounded with a group of people who will hold you accountable, who aren't on the road with you, but other people who can speak truth and life into you. And I did not have that in my life then. Mm. I very much do now. That's something, as, as I read through the book, a word kept coming to me in your story, and it's the word grace. Mm. God gave you grace, because there were tough moments, uh, a marriage that didn't last, yeah. and then finding another partner, marrying, yeah. blended family, yeah. the challenges of all of that, and, and dealing with hurt and pain and relationships. Yeah. But through that, you didn't give up on God. You know, I, I didn't. I wondered often if he gave up on me. Mm. You really worried about that. I did very, yeah. very much. But I always had a part of me that just would say, God, just comfort me. Just yeah. tell me, I want to do your will. I just don't know what it is. Yeah. Just guide me. And there has always been just a longing in my heart to be ever closer to the Father. One reason I hope people get this book if they don't do it for anything else, it's because there are a lot of people who have done things they're deeply ashamed of. Yeah. They did things that hurt other people yeah. and That's... they don't think God can forgive them and they don't think other people will forgive them yeah. and they feel like it's over, yeah. it's it. Yeah. This book, your story reminds us 
that God's not finished with us until he makes that decision. Until he makes that call. And that's so, And he but, is the God of second chances yeah. and the God of new beginnings. There is restoration that has to happen and restitution on our part. Yeah. There is an openness that we have to allow people, whether it's my kids or whether it's a church that I worked with, to be able to say to me some of the ways that I hurt them. Mm. But there has to, there comes a point where there's restoration closure, that it is okay to leave those things at the foot of the cross yeah. and move on and let God do a new thing. The fact that you were so forthcoming and you didn't say, oh, well, I just asked God to forgive me, everything was okay. No. This was a, a very painful process. Yeah. But one of the things that I was so refreshed by, you, you talked about in your story, that there was that time when you wondered, will the audience, will those people who have listened to my music, will they still respond? Mm -hmm. And going back out of the stage and feeling their love, mm -hmm. their warmth, that must have been one of the most extraordinary moments that you've ever had. I, I wondered, I, I was ready to just walk away from all of it because yeah. in the moment for me, as I began to get, wow, that was really weird. My eyelash just came off. Huh. So. I don't have that problem. This I, is live no. TV, y'all, so here we go. Okay, you look, <laughs> you look lovely without them. <laughs> well, there you go. <laughs> so where were we? So I do, I do have something I wanna say about okay. that. Um, you know, we were talking about, a little bit about consequences. And, yeah. You know, I've learned forgiveness is not the same as consequences. Hmm. There are always consequences and they continue sometimes in different seasons of our family's life. Yeah. Whether it's a wedding or a funeral, you know, you have the blended family to work through, which sort of piles on or can all that shame again. Mm. And you just have to walk yourself back through the truth. Yeah. And acknowledge, yeah, it's hard. It's just hard. Yeah. But we're very, we feel very grateful for the community that has been around us. Our kids have a community. My husband and I have a community, you know, to speak into us and help us be the best people we can be. It was a printer's error on an album listed her as Sandy Patty that created the name Sandra Patty would go by right up to this day. The only change being replacing the letter I on her last name with a Y. When we continue, Sandy talks about the personal toll of celebrity status and the healing power of Christ. Sandy Patty is a Gospel Music Hall of Fame member and with five Grammys and winning the Dove Awards Female Vocalist of the Year 11 straight times, I think she's earned her spurs, but not without difficulties off the stage or grace from God to carry her forward. Sandy, how hard is it when you're, a, and I don't want to use this word in, a, in an offensive way, a celebrity, but I mean, honestly, you're a celebrity. You have a platform, you sing to millions of people. They buy your records, they see you in a spotlight. How hard is it to come off the stage and to just be normal? It used to be, I used to try to make who I was on stage come off stage with me. Hmm. That just did not work very well. I think as God began to just reframe so much in my life, he began to reframe that I have to start with being a woman of God. Mm. Um, that's my priority and take all of that with me on stage or to the line at Target yeah. or when I get gas. That all my, is, my whole life is Romans 12, one and two to present your body, your every day, you're going out and coming in as a living sacrifice, mm. whether that's on stage for a lot of people to see or being kind to my husband when no one can see, mm. it all matters. You told a story about a friend of yours who was very helpful to you. Her name is Carolyn and she, uh, when you were going through a period of just self-doubt, yeah. she made you go down to like a hardware store yes. and get this great big concrete block. Yes and carry it. Yes. Carolyn Tell me Gill, the story. I, this Carolyn is a, Gill has been one of my dear friends for a long time. She's an incredible life coach. Mm. Um, and one day I was just kind of walking her through how the shame I feel, 
you know, I'll never get rid of this shame and God never release it. And um, she said, you know, Sandy, have you asked for forgiveness? Have you walked me through no. all those things? She said, you know what, get in the car. So I got in the car <laughs> and we went to Lowe's and she said, I want you to go pick out a stone, any stone you want. <laughs> she says, it's gotta be heavy, but heavy enough, you know, uh -huh. light enough to carry, but it's gotta be heavy. So I picked up a stone and went out to pay for it. And the guy said, hey, would you like some help? I said, yes. Carolyn said, oh no, she doesn't need help. She can carry it herself. <laughs> and she, Carolyn said, here's the deal. You have to carry it with you everywhere you go. So I carried it with me to my car. I started to fumble for my keys. It's like, can you hold this a minute? No, I can't. You've got to hold it while you go about your everyday life. I said, it's impossible. She said, exactly. You cannot carry the things that we are not meant to carry. They will get in the way of life. Uh. And that was such a great lesson for me to, to leave it at the foot of the cross, to leave it with Jesus. I mean, that uh. was a process, but what a great picture image. We cannot carry the things that he is meant to carry for us. What a brilliant yeah application yeah. that your friend Carolyn yeah. gave you. Yeah. Do you guys not understand? Yeah. What a powerful yeah. illustration that is. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. I read that and I thought. I know. I wish I were smart enough to think of something like that. I know. Obviously I'll give I'm you not. your number if you need a life coach. <laughs> I could use several, a whole room full. Um, you're not doing the tour schedule these days. You're mentoring people. I am. How fulfilling is that for you? I love it so much. I, you know, all the years until about three years ago, I've been on the road for maybe 250 days. Huh. Um, a year? A year. Yeah. You know, that's not all concerts, but the time yeah. you travel and all that. And I've semi-retired, so I do a few things. And when Mike Huckabee calls and says, hey, would you come and tour us? I'm so know, glad you did because there's I want to yes. tell you, as I told you, this has been on my bucket list. <laughs> I'm not kidding. The thought that I get to meet Sandy Patty, have a conversation with her, has been honestly one of the greatest thrills. I mean, I've listened to your music. I made my children as they grew up. Oh. The, the Christmas album, <laughs> Do they need The Gift life Goes coach? On. <laughs> oh, yes. How many I hundreds of that. times have we played that in our family? I love that. I love you. I'm telling you, That's you have so meant sweet. so much to well, me. Well, and you're such a musician that I, I really appreciate that. I want to talk about your newest project, Forever Grateful. Yeah. What a great name, but tell me about that. Well, I wanted to do sort of one last big tour. Mm. I had a band, I had guest vocalists, I had Veritas, um, mm. just an amazing group of guy singers. My family was out with me. Um, we just went all over the country and I didn't want to say goodbye. Mm. Um, I wanted to, the opportunity to tell the people that I've worked for. Yeah. You know, I feel like I've called by God, but it's the people that I've worked for. Mm. And I wanted to say to them, thank you. And so um, we just sat around a meeting and I said, you know, I, what I am is I'm just eternally grateful. And someone said, well, you're forever grateful. Okay, well, that's it. So that's where right, forever grateful became the name of the tour. I asked my friend, Nicole Nordeman, I, who's a brilliant lyricist. And I said, I have some music and I have an idea for a song. Uh, called Forever Grateful. So I sent her the music and two days later she sent back the most beautiful lyric um, that we just kind of ended every night with um, telling the audience thank you for mm. how they have blessed me. Well, you have blessed us more than you can possibly ever know. Now, you know, you said this was not a farewell tour per se, but I mean, Cher's had about 17 farewell tours, hasn't she? <laughs> that so, is true. So you can have some more if you, you know, want. You know, I am loving, I'm artist in residence at our church in yeah. Oklahoma City, Crossings Community Church. Wonderful. My husband is on staff as one of the pastors, and I get to speak into the generation coming behind me, talking about why we do what we do. Why does it even matter? What's important about it? How do you be professional and you have a passion Mm -hmm. and you plan and you practice and you prepare and all the things that matter. Um, I love getting a chance to do that. Mm -hmm. and, and I love not having a suitcase packed all the time. That's just the best. That's got to be one of the most fulfilling things of all. Indeed. Well, the book is absolutely magnificent. You're so, thank, thank you. you for reading it. Now, thank you for writing it. Mm -hmm. It has blessed my life as it will anyone who gets a copy 
of this book. And I want you to get a copy of Sandy Patty's The Voice, as well as her latest release, Forever Grateful. You can get it by heading to sandypatty.com. In 2015, Sandy Patty announced her retirement from touring, citing a desire to spend time with eight wonderful grandchildren. I can relate to that. Well, in 2016, she released Forever Grateful. It's an album of new and classic material, and she went on a farewell tour. We were honored and blessed to have her with us right here in our Nashville studios. Sandy is currently the artist in residence at Crossings Community Church in Oklahoma City. We want to say thanks for joining us for this edition of Conversations. And be sure to join me each Saturday night at 8 p.m. Eastern on TBN for Huckabee. Good night and God bless.